All right, thanks for clicking on the video. I appreciate it. This is a one story video. It's a long one, but it's a really good one. And I hope you guys enjoyed. I think you will. It's great. Then at the end, I've got a little about 10 minutes of commentary that's probably going to hack some people off. That's the intent. I want to make some people so mad that they never come back to my channel again. That's a little odd for a YouTube channel to try to run people off. That's what I'm trying to do. If you want to hear it, stick around to the end. All right, let's get rolling with the story because it is a good one. All right, here we go. Okay, the writer's name is Todd, and here's what he writes. Hold on to your weave, son. <laughs> I got a strange story from Ohio to tell you. I hope someone who was in that campground that night or who lives in the area and heard it will remember the event and write in or comment. It happened at a campground with a lake just outside of Wilmington, Ohio during the summer vacation of 1983. I was almost 18 and my girlfriend was 17 at the time. Today, Becky and I have been married for 35 years. That's cool, man. That's an awesome... That right, I could end right there and just be happy for you, Todd. That's awesome. But let's, let's get on with your story. The campground consisted of 30 to 50 permanent campsites for trailers and RVs, I think, and there was also an area to the west end for overnight tent campers. On the south side of the lake were some woods that wrapped around to the east and the west. There were 40 yards of open area to the north side of the lake that reached down to a little beach area with the rest of the north shore set aside for fishing access. We were there with my best friend John, who was 19, and his girlfriend Judy, who was 21, and as such was the designated purchaser of alcohol for our group. They've been married now for 36 years. Oh, man, that's another great. That's awesome. John and Judy, 36 years. That's great. Judy's dad and older brother had adjacent permanent campsites at the campground, and since they were going to the races that weekend, the trailers were available. Because Becky and I were the only other couple in our little group of about a dozen friends, we were invited to join John and Judy for a romantic weekend getaway. Judy worked at Stump's Grocery Store at the Forest Park Plaza, so we picked her up there on Friday night when she finished her shift. While we were there, we purchased the supplies that we would need for the weekend, and then we headed out. We arrived a couple of hours before sundown and set up camp. The campground was packed with activity. The kids were riding their bikes on the gravel road that snaked its way through the park, People were walking their dogs, and men were riding around in their golf carts visiting neighbors. Several people stopped by to check up on Judy and ask about her dad and her brother. Off to the races was the standard reply. Soon we grilled our dinner, and the girls had gotten the trailers ready for the night. After that, we all sat around the campfire ring swapping stories, enjoying each other's company, and relaxing to the sounds of the southern Ohio summer night. The bugs, the frogs, and the nighttime birds created a wondrous symphony of calming sound. A couple of hours after dark, we all decided it was time to turn in for the night. Before we went to bed, we had to tidy up our campsite, and John and I were churning the fire with a shovel, when out of nowhere, and I mean like out of left field, we heard from way off in the distance what sounded like a woman screaming bloody murder. It was like her arms were being ripped from her body. John looked at me as if to say, Man, what are we hearing? The girls came over with us with puzzled expressions on their faces. Twenty seconds into the scream, it changed to what sounded like a baby crying. That lasted for another twenty seconds, and then there was nothing. We could hear the normal night sounds all around us, but the screaming stopped. The other campers burst out into chatter. What was that? What the hell was that? And a bounty of other anxious comments could be heard from every direction. We were certainly adding our share. The entire campground was abuzz with excitement and activity for another 10 or 15 minutes before everyone began to calm down and turn in for the night. 
We decided whatever it was, it was far enough away that it wasn't going to bother us. John and Judy took her parents' trailer, and Becky and I were in Judy's brother's trailer. Once inside, Becky and I were winding down, smoking a cigarette, and having a pretty lively discussion about what had just happened. What exactly did you hear? she asked. And then before I could answer, she added, I heard a woman screaming in distress. Then it changed into like a baby crying. Yeah, that's exactly what I heard, I said. Well, what do you think it was? I think it was a bobcat, she said, again, not letting me answer. You know, they're still in Ohio. Well, I quickly answered, well, I don't know about that. There are mountain lions down in the Smokies, and with the warm weather, maybe one of them made its way up here into Ohio. We both pondered that for a moment before she asked, how did it cross the Ohio River then? He crossed over the Brent Spence Bridge like everyone else, I quipped. Oh, you're funny. I suppose he did it during rush hour, too, she exclaimed as she threw her shirt at me. Well, he did sound like one pissed off cat, I laughed. We began to ponder again, and she climbed into bed. A stream of ideas came to me, and I said, you know, maybe some local has an exotic cat as a pet. Or we aren't too far from Cincinnati. Maybe some rich guy or Reds player, or even better, a Bengals player, bought themselves a big cat, and it escaped. Her reply was, wouldn't we have heard about that on the news? Well, not necessarily, I answered. If they didn't have the right permits to own an exotic pet and it escaped, they wouldn't want to get into trouble, so they ain't going to call anybody. Remember Shannon? Her family had to move to Michigan because Ohio passed that law where you have to have a permit to own exotic pets. Her family had those two cheetahs, but they didn't get the permits. Oh, yeah, you're right, she said. Now, get your butt in bed. Now, see there? Don't you feel better about it and all? I answered, returning a grin. Yes, come to bed already, she groaned. I had no sooner turned off the light when I heard the faint sound of a baby crying. I turned to Becky and saw her eyes getting bigger and knew she was hearing it too. Before either of us could speak a word, the sound changed to the woman screaming bloody murder again. A cat, remember? It's just a cat, I spoke up quickly. It's a very big cat, she added. From inside the trailer, the sound was faint, but we could still hear it as it changed into something like a jungle cat's growl. And then it became more like a lion's roar. And then it changed yet again to what we have come to refer to as a mix of an angry King Kong versus Godzilla. With the eyes as big as saucers and our jaws dropped to our chests, We stared at each other for what felt like an hour, but it was in reality only a few seconds. What the hell was that, Becky whispered. Before I could answer, the damn thing started up again. This time it started with the King Kong vs. Godzilla roar, followed by a bear's roar. I burst out of our trailer to find John poking his head out of his. The growl had already changed to that of a lion and now morphing into that of a jungle cat's growl. When it changed back into the screaming woman, John muttered, What is that? The sound faded back into that of a baby crying and John came out to stand beside me. The campground was beginning to come to life again. Someone yelled, Can someone shut that thing up? Someone else said, What is that? Further down still, another camper asked, Did you hear that? Standing outside, it sounded louder and closer than when we heard it earlier that night, though it still seemed to be coming from the same general direction, which was southwest of the campgrounds. We stood there for several seconds, lost in thought, as we anticipated the next sound. How far away do you think it is? John asked, startling me back to reality. And do you have any ideas, Sherlock? He added before I could answer. Well, sarcastically, calling me Sherlock was a running gag between us brought on by my frequent use of the phrase elementary, my dear Watson, elementary. But this time he sounded nervous. Becky and I thought it might be a big cat, like a bobcat or a mountain lion, I told him. A mountain lion in Ohio? I was sure he was going to add, are you nuts? But I cut him off by adding, or it could be someone who owns a big cat. Remember Shannon? He looked puzzled for a moment before remembering and saying, oh yeah, the girl with the cool looking jungle cats. 
They were cheetahs, I corrected him. Have you ever heard anything like that before? Those parts that sound like a bear, I mean? The big gorilla or something, he asked. I noted a bit of quiver in his voice. It was a regular King Kong, I said, unwilling to give a direct answer. We snapped our heads back to the southwest as the baby crying sound started up again. The depth and duration of the calls was unbelievable. It wasn't like it was one sound, take a breath and then another. It was one continuous deep call lasting anywhere from 50 seconds to two minutes, transforming from baby to woman to animal in one breath. The lung capacity of whatever was out there had to be massive, and the range was incomprehensible. John and I stood there looking at each other, mentally repeating the same question everyone was asking. What was this thing? It still sounded like it was pretty far off in the distance. I was guessing around 5 to 10 miles away. Alarming, yes, but I didn't feel like we were in any danger. That's why John's next statement caught me off guard. Man, we have shotguns in the trailers and spotlights if we need them. Let me show you where yours are in the trailer. We went inside and he showed me where the shotgun and box of shells were. And then he pulled out a spotlight and we made sure the battery was working. It was one of those old 1960s handheld lights made with the VW Beetle headlight attached to a metal battery box that had a handle on it. I don't remember the gauge of the shotgun, but I do remember that it held five shells and it was a pump action. John, Becky, and I then went outside and stood for 20 minutes. It had been half an hour or more since we last heard its call when John broke the silence with, Well, I'll see you guys in the morning. Good night. Hey, I'm only a year younger than you, old man, I replied. John turned and went back to his trailer with a smile on his face. When we went back inside, Becky peppered me with questions about what John and I thought it was. I'm not sure how long we stayed up, but I can say one thing for sure. The night no longer had any romantic feeling. I don't know how long it was until we heard it again, but I would venture to guess it was around an hour later when King Kong started up again. By the time it had worked its way to the jungle cat, I was out the door with my shoes on, a shotgun in one hand, and the spotlight in the other. It was no longer just a faint sound inside the trailer. Outside, it was even louder. And now it sounded like it was just across the lake. John was out his door almost as fast as I was, and he was wearing his shoes and carrying his gun and his light as well. The whole campground seemed to be awake. People were coming out of their trailers and RVs and gathering in small groups. John and I walked down to the road as the call wound down to the baby crying. That sounds just like it's across the lake, John said, confirming my earlier thought. We were standing at the edge of the road closest to the lake where there was mostly open field. The woods across the lake were silent as a grave. Gone was the music of the night dwellers, the insects, the frogs, and any other wildlife all seemed to be holding their collective breath. We could hear the people from the campground behind us talking and opening and closing doors. And after a few minutes, a couple in their 30s and a man in his 50s joined us where we stood. We formed a little group, made our introductions, and then quickly turned our conversation to the same questions we'd all been asking for hours. Another man walked past us and called to us. It's a banshee. Man, I tell you, it's a banshee. We all chuckled nervously, but swallowed our laughter when all hell broke loose across the lake. The baby crying started again, followed by the cracking of wood. It sounded like a bulldozer was tearing through that timber. In my lifetime, I have heard and seen deer, elk, moose, and bears crash through the forest. Nothing, and I mean nothing, even come close to the cracking of wood that we heard that night. John and I spun around and flipped on our light. As the call changed from the baby crying to the woman screaming, we could clearly see the trees and bushes shaking, but we couldn't see what it was making the commotion. It was coming from the southwest and heading east. 
By the time the call had made its usual gamut of jungle cat to lion to bear to King Kong versus Godzilla, it had made it halfway to the bottom stretch of the lake. The guy who walked by with the Banshee theory ran past us at a dead sprint back to his trailer. (laughs) Oh, God, that's funny. Okay, I'm not laughing or ridiculing anyone. Just just want to be clear there. I just thought that sentence was funny. I, I do have a sense of humor. We could still see the trees and bushes swaying back and forth as the thing made its way to the east side of the lake. The woman in our little group said to no one in particular, My God, what is that thing? And then, as an afterthought, she added, And what are we going to do about it? It wasn't screaming anymore, but we could still see it crashing through the woods. It was halfway to the road that dead ended in the woods on the east side of the lake. But there, it could easily run up the east side road about a hundred yards or so right into the campground. We were all sizing up the situation and formulating possible outcomes. Not more than a year before that night, I had watched the movie Rambo. (laughs) Furthermore, I was a big fan of Billy Jack movies from the 1970s. As if that wasn't enough, I saw myself as a hoodlum from the mean streets of Dayton, Ohio. So it should come as no surprise that I was thinking John and I should head over to the East Side Road cut this thing off at the pass and teach it a lesson by filling it full of lead. I was just about to make that very suggestion when John said, I don't know about you guys, but we're getting the hell out of here now. The rest of us were so startled by John's words that we just stood there dumbfounded as he walked away. A second later, we sprung into action, each of us heading back to our respective trailers. I didn't catch up with John until we were almost to the trailers and the girls were dressed and standing outside and they were waiting for us. Get the stuff packed, girls, he barked. We're out of here. They were way ahead of us. All we had to do was put away the guns, lock up the trailers and jump in the car and go. It must have taken us a good 20 minutes to get out of the campground because of the traffic. It looked more than half of the campers were heading home. We kept a watchful eye on the east road as we sat in the long line of cars, but nothing ever came out of the woods. Once we'd answered all the girls' questions, the ride home was pretty quiet. We never heard anything about it on the news, and after a week or so, the frenzied questions and the retelling of the story to our group of friends died down. Over the years, Beck and I have shared this story with various new friends that we've met. A couple of weeks ago, I shared a Dixie Cryptid video with Becky, and she suggested that I send the story. So here it is, and we're sticking to it. There were a lot of people in that campground that night, and a lot of them left, not to mention all the people who lived in a 20-square-mile radius of the campground. We would love to hear from anyone who experienced those strange calls in the summer of 1983. One other thing, I often wonder what would happen that night if I had spoken up first with my Billy Jack plan. (laughs) I guess we'll never know. Thank goodness. Oh, man, what a great story. Nobody was hurt. Everybody was just scared. And you heard a a really unique sound. I mean, it sounded like it went on all night, Todd. But I don't know what else to say about this story. He's This man obviously has a sense of humor. Uh, unlike some of the uh, really curmudgeon Bigfoot people in the Bigfoot community. But this guy has a sense of humor, and he can laugh. He can actually laugh at himself, and I love these kind of stories. I really really appreciate him sending it. Okay, the video that I uploaded yesterday, it's called The Sheep Squatch, had about five minutes of a candid conversation between myself, Will Jevening, uh, Tom with Creek Devil, and uh, Neoma Finn. It wasn't really part of the interview. It was just part of a conversation that we were having after, you know, it was all over. Well, I listened to it and I thought it was kind of funny. I thought people would get a kick out of it. But apparently we've offended some people and that was never the intention. According to some commenters, we're ridiculing people who have had experiences and we're 
being, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, and I have to go through this about every six months or a year because there is this certain segment of the Bigfoot world, people who follow this topic like it's a religion and they, uh, and, and they're also people who look for ways to be offended. That's very common in this culture, this, this looking for a way to stand out and be offended and, and be insulted is common in our culture. I don't have that, and so it's hard for me to be real careful about that stuff because I grew up, I don't know, people making fun of me all the time, telling me I'm full of crap and me laughing it off and them laughing with me and everything stays happy. And I, 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 don't, I don't know where all of this stuff comes from. Let me tell you a little bit something about this channel, and I've, I'm just going. I'm just being repetitive about some things I've said before. I am not part of the Bigfoot community. I don't want to be a part of that Bigfoot community, so I don't project that image, and I don't come across that way because I'm not in that group. I don't watch Bigfoot videos 24 hours a day. I just do my own thing and I go to work and I spend time with my family. I, I just, it's just not a huge interest for me, but I do love these stories. I love the encounter stories and I have never once, uh, this September, I will have been doing this three years. I have never once in the whole time I've done this channel ridiculed a single person who has had a Bigfoot encounter. Never. Yet I'm accused of that when a segment of a video comes up where people talk candidly about their thoughts on Bigfoot. And so I saw a meme not too long ago, and it was like uh, someone doing a podcast or a video says, uh, if you'd like to see this video, open the description below, click on the link that says ABC, and you'll be able to watch this video. And the meme above it is a viewer looking at it going, hey, where can we watch that video? It's like in the comment section. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not recreating the meme very well here, but you get my point. You're not listening to what we're saying. You're looking for anything anybody says so you can pounce on them. And I thought really about six or eight months ago that we had rid ourselves of all these Bigfoot uh, there's a certain segment in the Bigfoot community that is very serious. They're very staunch. They're very orthodox. You can't, you cannot waver off of this little lane and get into other areas. Uh, are you? Are you? They ridicule you. They they don't have any problem ridiculing you. So just to be clear, this channel is not like that. We're we're not. I, I, I'm not an advocate for Bigfoot. I don't care if Bigfoot exists or not. It has no effect on my life at all. I don't care if Dogman exists. I don't care. That's one thing I like about Will Jevening. I was telling him all this stuff. He doesn't give a crap what I think about that. He and I are still friends. Will Jevening has his opinions on things. I have my opinions on things. Mark Newble and Larry Porch have their opinions on things. And there are two dozen other out there who share their thoughts and creativity with you on Bigfoot. They have all their own opinions on things. We don't all agree. I mean, there's no way people are all going to agree on the same thing. So I'm asking you to please look at this channel as entertainment. I'm not here for people to come for therapy. That's not what I do. I, this is not, a, a, I'm not a Bigfoot evangelist. Bigfoot politics, the Baptist church, the Catholic church, the Mormon church, none of that is my religion. I don't care about any of that stuff. I just want to tell you stories, and I want this channel to be fun for people. Here's the deal. We're getting about twenty to 50,000 views per video. So let's, let's just say we get 20,000 views per video, per story video. About 2,000 of those are the Bigfoot people. Now, in that 2,000, there are some great people. There's some great people, but out of that 2,000 of the 20,000, there's about 100 who are just total jerks. 
total Bigfoot orthodox jerks. And those are the people who make the comments like you'll see in my last video. And I hoped like crazy that we had rid ourselves of all those people, but apparently we haven't. And so uh, to those 100 people out of the 20,000 who watch my videos, this message is for you. I don't care if you go away or not. I, I hope you do. I hope you can hide my channel from your recommend feed. I don't care. And then, and then I've got all these people who are so concerned that my channel is taking a hit. Let me be clear. I have a day job. I, I do this for fun. Yes, YouTube pays me for running ads in the videos, but that's not my source of income. My source of income is my job. It's a job I've had since I was 16 years old. I've got a lot of time invested in it. I do this because I wanted to do something outside of the construction industry. I love reading. I love writing. I love telling stories. I really love that out of 20,000, 19,900 of you enjoy those stories. That's what really gives me the steam. And so I love all the people who are always so nice in the comment section. And there's thousands of people out there per video that listen to these videos who never comment. And when they see what you write in some of these comments, I know they're rolling their eyes. Let me get back to the demographics of who's watching. So of 20,000 people watching my videos, there's probably 2,000 who are Bigfoot people who are interested in the Bigfoot topic. But the other 18,000 people don't could care less about Bigfoot. They just love hearing a good narrated story. Bigfoot stories are exciting stories. They just are. They always are. They always have been. So uh, they come over for the stories, and when they see all this crap going on, you know, I know it turns them off to the whole Bigfoot community. And I get accused all the time because I do fiction, I do fun stories, I do funny stories. I used to do stories by kids. And people tell me that I'm hurting the calls of Bigfoot over and over and over. I, got, I, I can't tell you how many emails and comments I got of people saying that I'm ruining the credibility of the topic. No, you are. You are ruining the credibility of the topic. I went out and I found an audience that could care less about Bigfoot, but is getting exposed to Bigfoot. Now, I don't care if they believe in Bigfoot or not. All I care about is that I do a good story for them. But you apparently care if they believe in Bigfoot. And all you do over and over and over is run people off. You turn people off. I'm not the one doing it. I'm drawing people into the topic. You're running them off. So put that in the bank next time you want to make a nasty comment on somebody's video because others are out there reading them. They're the people that think you're nuts. They're the people who don't want to have anything to do with this topic other than through the internet and have a virtual presence just listening about the topic. You can listen to me or not. You can believe me or not. But everything I've told you is grounded. Everything is grounded in logic, and it's true. It's true. I look at my demographics and my analytics. I know who's watching these videos. I know the age groups. I know what their interests are. I see the other channels that they watch. I'm telling you, out of 20,000, 18,000 people, aren't into this Bigfoot topic. They're just into narrated stories and, and they kind of stumble on the channel and they're like, hey, this is pretty cool. But you orthodox, crazy Bigfoot people who want everything to stay the same all the time. You used to love my channel. You wished my channel hadn't changed. My channel hasn't changed a bit. I've always done stories. I'm still narrating stories. After about a year, I started doing interviews. I'm still doing interviews. I'm just presenting them in a little different way. There's nothing that's changed about the channel. Nothing. And if you don't like my channel and you don't think I'm bringing legitimacy or respect to the Bigfoot topic, I don't care what you think. I, I'm not trying to gain credibility because I don't want to be included in that number of people in the Bigfoot community. I, I, matter of fact, I'm going to avoid you gonna avoid you all right oh, I, I don't know those comments just drove me crazy and i'm like who was offended who 
who did we ridicule? We didn't ridicule anything. The only thing I said in the uh, that I said in the whole interview was if somebody tells me that they're having mind speak with a wolf, they're full of crap. I'm going to tell them you're full of crap. And if they're a well-balanced person, they're going to go, oh, no, I'm not full of crap. I really do talk to them. And I'll go, really? Tell me about it. Or we're going to laugh it off or something like that. But no. Oh, no. No, we can't. We can't go down that road. We have to go to the offended road and the ridicule road. That was not what was happening in that interview at all, at all. So, all right, I've talked enough. I hope you continue to enjoy these stories because I'm just going to keep doing the same thing I've always done is share with you viewer encounter stories. And if you're in this orthodox, crabby, old, nasty Bigfoot group, I hope you leave. I hope this makes you so mad that you're going to leave. And I and go all over the internet and talk about what a jackass Cam Buckner is. Go ahead and do it. That's fine. Just, just do it. People will flood in like crazy and they'll watch my videos. Go ahead. All right. I got to get back to work. Hope you guys enjoyed the story. I have this bad problem with the truth. And what I'm speaking is the truth. All right. You guys have a good week. We'll see you on the next video.